please welcome Super Bowl champion and a great Trojans, Pete Carroll. Hey, what's up, buddy? Oh! Oh, come on! Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, Glenna. That, that's the one chant they didn't continue in Seattle, I noticed. Welcome back, Pete. It's great to have you back at USC. Thanks, Dave. It's great to be here. Boy, you know how to throw a class. Look, <laughs> Look at this. This is something. It's grown a bit since you were last here, but uh, we wanted to make sure that everybody got a chance to hear you talk because it's so much more than football when, we, when you come to USC. Um, let's sort of recap. Where, uh, where are you coming in from? Well, we're just uh, coming from the Indianapolis Combine. Just uh, took a look at all the kids coming up for this draft and, and got the process underway. It's a big, big deal to us, you know, and this is, this is like recruiting for us uh, as it is in college. So uh, it's a very important aspect of it. You know, we're always looking to stay young and keep it competitive. So that's, that's what this part's all about. Excellent. Did, uh, I think there were like seven USC Trojans at the Combines. Yeah, yeah, uh, they did well. Saw some of them. Yeah, Good they did well. well. Yeah, Marquise did real well. We got to visit with some guys. Uh, Xavier did a great job in, in his interviews and stuff. And it's a very important moment for these kids, you know, and, and uh, uh, they don't know what they're getting into, and they kind of get inundated with this with the NFL in, in, a, in quick order. So it's very fun. It was a good day. Well, thanks for thanks for coming back here, stopping over in your good house. Good to be here. It's great good to be, be here. Good to be here in And Bovard. In <laughs> Bovard. So we want to talk tonight. At, you know, we, we will underscore a lot of the the tools and the methodology that you have with football because it certainly proves what you're doing. But uh, we want to talk about your philosophy: uh, win forever, always compete. Before we dive in, can you give us a short summary of what that is? What does win forever mean? Well, it, uh, I'll tell you a little quick story. Uh, years ago, first year I was coaching uh, as a head coach at the New York Jets. We played the opening game in Buffalo. And uh, not, not very high expectations, playing against a tremendous run that they had had there at, at, at the Bills. You guys might not remember it, but they were really good for a while. And uh, <laughs> we went out there, and, and somehow, we, we pulled off a win, won the opening game of the year. And when the game was over, before we got back on the buses, I had a chance to walk back out in the stadium, you know, when the guys are cleaning up and there's nobody out there. And I took a look up on, the, on the, the, the wall of where their offices were in the back end of the stadium, and there was the, uh, the dates of their division championships and, and, and conference championships, one right after another. And you, you may not remember, but the Buffalo Bills played in four Super Bowls and didn't win any of them. But to get to those Super Bowls, they had had a run of seven or eight years in there where they had one year after year after year after year. And it was, that was the moment that I looked up there and I said, wow, that, that's, that's really the true testament of, of, of being big time. Winning year after year after year. I know they didn't win the, the Super Bowls, and I was thinking this to myself. I mean, it's like they won forever. And that was where the first thought of that ever came from. And uh, from that point, um, years later, years later, it made sense to me that uh, what when you're really doing your best is when you're working to be the very best you can be. And sometimes, you know, you can't win every game, and you can't win all the time, and you can't win all the championships. But as long as you are, are striving to be your best, then that, to me, that's winning. And so uh, from that came the thought, if you want to win forever, you got to always compete. And, and uh, that's what we've been doing ever since. And so that's kind of where it came from. And so the, let's talk core values before philosophy. The core values, the central tenets of win forever is competition. If you were to describe yourself in one word, it would be a competitor. competitor. Yeah. So give me some of the other core values that you think are, are important and embodied in the win forever philosophy. Well, first off, what we're trying to do in, in whenever we're connecting with anybody that, you know, whether they're a player or a coach in the system, administration, people, anybody, the kids in the streets that we work with, uh, it's always about trying to figure out what somebody could possibly be. And then working with them to help create a vision for what that could look like, feel like and then taking them uh, to the point where they, by coaching them and staying with them, reminding them why they're worthy of that vision until they eventually accomplish it. And uh, that's really the, the, the baseline thought behind what we're trying to get done. And so if you can look at it in terms of, of coaching you know, a quarterback, like coaching Matt Leinart back in the day, or coaching an entire football team, we looked at it in the same way. How good could Matt Leinart be? And what, what would he be possibly of accomplishing? How good could this team be? What, what we, could we possibly accomplish if we all work together? The, the, the main thing about that comes out is that if you're 
to become the best you can be, I think somewhere in there you got to find somebody who's going to coach you. <laughs> you know, you need to be coached because it's really hard for individuals or teams to stay on course with, with their potential. You need somebody to kick you in the butt sometimes. You need somebody to remind you of who you are and, and what you're capable of doing in, 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 in constant fashion, keep you in touch with that vision. And, and once that all begins to happen, you really can't stop it. Let me just go back on the other end of that. The, to show you what the power of vision is, is that when we were working in the streets, and I know we may talk about this a little bit later, and, and hats off to the Better LA guys that are here in the house. I know they're here tonight. Where, where are you guys? I, I can't see you, but yeah. thanks for being here with us. Yeah, one time. But, but they, know, they know the power of vision because they, the, the kids that they deal with, and I know for years, would say, I'm either going to die or I'm going to jail. And th that, that didn't ring true to me until I heard it enough times when I realized that was exactly a vision. That's how those kids lived, and that's, what, that's all they had to look forward to. So certainly they created that. They couldn't stop it. They were reminded of it daily. They, were, they, they couldn't help but focus on it, and that vision kept coming to life. Well, that's one end of the spectrum, but the, the, the power of vision really works on the other end of it too, and you can create whatever you want to create if you're willing to go for it. And, and so uh, that's really what's behind all of this. You know, that, that, that's where, where, where it began. The competition thing became, you know, my way of describing myself. And uh, that, that meant that if it really was true, then I was going to try to find a way to weave that, that thought into everything that we were going to do so I could constantly be, in connected, be connected with that emphasis. And so competition became the central theme of our program. And in everything we do, we're trying to win, lose, and battling, and trying to figure out what that all means. And there's a lot to that. And, and when people are finding their own philosophy, they have to find their own drivers. It doesn't have to be competition. It could be other things. Absolutely. Uh, there are other core values that uh, sort of we associate with it. Yeah. Optimistic guy. You generally see things pretty brightly, don't you? Yeah. The, the, uh, I basically, I, my mom taught me a long time ago that something's good just about to happen. And so that's kind of a way of life. You know, you look at everything kind of optimistically and favorably that, you know, you can, something possibly is going to come your way. Uh, that is part of the way we think. It's, it's part of the makeup of our program. We were thinking Super Bowl from the, the time we met four years ago without even having to focus on that. We knew what was out there. We knew what we were going for. And, and that was it was going to come about, and so, uh, but I, that's a, a way of thinking. Uh, communication is a huge element to us, to being able to, to communicate with our people so that we can always stay in connection with them, because if you're going to help somebody be the best they can possibly be, you've got to figure out who they are. You've got to learn who they're, who, who, what they're all about, and so the only way to do that is to observe and communicate and, and grow with the process so that someday you have a really clear image of what it takes to get that person or that team to go where, you, where, where they can possibly go. So a uh, huge element. Uh, the, the, the guidelines that stay with us in the philosophy is that you either compete or you're not. You know, there's no in-between. You're either going for it or you're not. And so we try to stay in connection with that. If, uh, if you're a member of our organization, you realize that, that we are in a relentless pursuit of finding a competitive edge in everything that we're doing. You know, that, that's a real mindset. Uh, that sounds... Sounds like a lot. If you're in relentless pursuit of finding a competitive edge in all things that you're doing, then there is no rest. There is no time when you take a step back. You're always competing to find that way. That tenet has kept us on track for a long time. Um, there's another one that, that I think is a really cool one that, that has come about in the last couple of years, that we're developmental coaches. Uh, what's a, it's a real pillar of what we're all about, that our coaches in our program know that the players that we have are all we have, and we're going to do everything we can to make them the best possible. We're not looking for what guys can't do. We're looking for what they can do, and what, what are they capable of doing? What is unique, uh, uniquely uh, part of that, that person's makeup that we might be able to accent and, and surface and, and illuminate uh, to bring out his best, and, and on and on. So there's a lot of it, but that's something. Oh, we're going we're to dive into it. We're going to dive in. And so uh, Win Forever, even though it's, it's based on competition and you're a football coach, it's not just for sports, it's not just for athletes, it's for everything. And uh, you know, some smart organizations are, are uh, retaining Win Forever and using Win Forever methods, including Microsoft in Seattle. Yes. You've got a big program with them. And, and just recently, uh, uh, Dr. Michael Gervais, your partner, completed yeah. a, a program here at USC with... Uh, with uh, Joe Priester and yeah. a bunch of other professors. All the students are here. And so uh, they know that it's real. It's not just talk. It's actually things that if you practice and you utilize, you really can make a difference. So let's talk before the philosophy. Okay. Before that was crystallized and you had it dialed in. And by the way, we know it's always changing and you're always learning. But let's go back a little bit and give people some context. You weren't always Super Bowl champion. In fact, your first time in the NFL, 
Uh, By the way, let me, let me interrupt you. I did notice that you did mention the 19-second thing here about the, uh, the Texas game. As I mentioned <laughs> in the introduction, I did, I did catch that, and just so that you know. I, it's, I did hear it. It's, you know, it's you didn't have to say that. You, know, you could just let that go. You know, you <laughs> but you knew. I, 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 but you knew that was going to get me a little bit, and so you did. It, 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 well, it's, not, it's not about you, actually. It's just the years and years of therapy I finally have recovered. I know, but every year we've done this, you always do that. You know? <laughs> Figured one of these times. Well, we're, be, we're beyond that okay, now. But uh, <laughs> no, or so my therapist says. <laughs> yes. uh, so you spent uh, almost 40 years now coaching, right? 40 years coaching at the college and professional levels. In your 20s, you hustled your way uh, from job to job, moving up the ladder. You became a young star uh, as the Jets' defensive co coordinator in the early 90s, and you were one of the youngest head coaches uh, in the NFL when you took over the Jets in 1994. Your team comes out of the gate pretty well, but then finishes six and ten, and you're fired after one season. One Louis season. Does. He loves to do this. <laughs> <laughs> one season. That's okay. I can take it. Did, did you suspect your job was in jeopardy? And can you tell us about your reaction to that? Because I think it's very poignant. Because everybody's going to get fired at some point in their life. Yeah. Well, here, here's the deal. Okay. We, we're we're six and five. We are uh, playing Miami in New York uh, for first place in in the, in the East, AFC East. And we're up, we're, we're killing them, we're having a great game. And somehow it starts to go. Boomer Esiason all of a sudden can't throw the ball to anybody but them. We get interception, touchdown, interception here, and it just goes south and we just, and if you remember, some of you that are NFL his, history buffs, there's a, there's a game in here where Dan Marino faked the spike and threw it to the guy outside. Well, that was my game. Uh, <laughs> never got to live that one down, even though, anyway. Um, <laughs> But the problem with that was is we didn't, we lost, we'd go on to lose the next four games. So we were playing for first place week, week 12 of the NFL season in our first year, you know, and we were kind of going, and, and then all of a sudden it just went south and we lost it. So the season's over, and uh, as the coaches, you know, we get to, we start working on next year. We're looking at the roster. We're looking, it was the first year the cap was coming up. Uh, so we had a lot of stuff that we're working on. And I, I get a, on my door, uh, a coach, um, they want to see you in the general manager's office, Dick Steinberg's office. Mr. Hess is here, Leon Hess. Leon Hess is the, uh, the I don't know, the sludge oil magnate of all time. And it made a huge industry of, of taking sludge oil and, and making some product out of it and made himself a multi-billionaire. And uh, worked from rags to riches, great story and all that, tough as you can be and tough as nails. I talked to him one time in, in, the, in the four years preceding at the time I'm at the Jets. So I'm walking, I say, hey, cool, I get to go see Leon. What's going on, you know, go down to go visit with Leon. I walk in, in Dick Steinberg's office, and there's two chairs, and he's sitting in one of them, and there's another one facing him. It's kind of off to the side in the corner, and I, this looks odd, you know, and I, I sit down and, you know, shake hands. How you doing? He said, he said, Pete, a man in your position in the business world would resign, but I know you're not going to do that. And I'm thinking, in the business world, resign, and you know I'm not going to do that. You're fired. <laughs> See, I just signed a four-year contract, you know, and, and, and I had no idea. You know, we had a lousy finish to the season and all, but I had, it didn't see it coming. I, I look over at Dick Steinberg, and he's just like, you know, he, he was finding out for the first time, too. And the next thought I had, I said, this is the most amazing thing that ever happened. I've got three more years on my contract. we got to go to Disney World. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you, that's, Glenna's out here. She'll, she'll attest to it because we were there about four days later. <laughs> and... Uh, So I mean, my mom came through, I guess, you know, <laughs> something good is just about to happen. But uh, it, it was an extraordinary moment. You know, I, I really thought I was looking right in the face of the devil at the time, you know. <laughs> I couldn't believe it was happening. <laughs> but it, it is a great illustration. You know, it is a great illustration that you, sometimes you just don't know. And uh, we hadn't done great. But, uh, you know, he went on to the next year, and I'll tell you the best part of the story is I think they went 1 in 15. So, uh, you know. <laughs> Sucks to be them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you can never put your program in place. You don't have your players. You don't have anything in place in one year. So no excuses. It, it's we tough were to six do. and ten. <laughs> so so the fall, you, you get the call in, uh, in New England uh, from 97 to 99, where you lead the Patriots uh, to the playoffs in two of three years. But again, after the third year, you're terminated. You're fired. <laughs> this time with some comments about your sort of laid-back coaching style. Um, what did you take away from that experience, and well, what did you do during the period of reflection? Well, let's go after? back for a moment here so that you can set the stage <laughs> the for context. The, 
Bill Parcells is, was the Bill Parcells was, was the head coach before I, I got the job. They had just gone to the Super Bowl and gotten beat by uh, Brett Favre and the Green Bay Packers. He doesn't fly back on the, on the team plane. He, goes, so he, he doesn't want any part of that organization because he no longer had the power to make the decisions on personnel and all of that. He had found that out in the, leading into the season. So he was, he was out the door. So now, if, if any of you remember Bill Parcells, and a young crowd here and all that, but he was, he, he was like a till of the hun compared to me. Um, and he had run the... the all of his organizations with, the, with heavy hands, strong fisted and all of that. Matter of fact, when uh, the first day that we're going to go to camp, my first camp, summer camp, training camp, on, in the newspaper, on the, in the sports page of the Boston Globe or whatever it was, a full length picture, caricature of Bill Parcells with, with uh, 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 pearl handled pistols and standing with this, you know, really grump look on his face, and I'm standing next to, uh, with a surfboard, bare feet, and a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, how they, that's how they characterized us. It, it, and I hadn't even coached a game yet. <laughs> so it was going to be a very difficult, it was a difficult you know, transition to make that I was more than welcome. I, I was at the point where I thought, of course I can do a better job than Coach Parcells had done, you know, and I'll, we'll take this thing, we'll win the Super Bowl in the next year. So uh, it was a very difficult time. We, we win the division the first year, um, win a playoff game, lose in, in the conference championship game. The next year we, we go back uh, as a um, wild card team, and the next year we're fighting for an 8-8 eight eight season. We win the last game to make it 8-8, eight and, eight, and I get fired that day. And uh, so... Uh, there was a new stadium being built. There was a lot of politics going on. A, a tremendous, tremendous family. Uh, you know, the Crafts were a great family, and Robert Kraft, who hired me, he hired me on the rebound from Bill Parcells, and he got what he wanted. He got a guy that would communicate with him and talk to him and help him through. Parcells locked him out <laughs> of, of the facility, so he got much different, a much different, uh, um, you know, ex exchange with his head coach. But at the time, he felt he needed to make a change. Well, he he hired. Bill Belichick, and, and Bill fortunately drafted Tom, and from then on, the, the rest is history. They had a great run and did a great job. But they were 4-12 and 12 the year, the first year, so sucks to be them that year. <laughs> so um, I don't think you should detect that as bitterness, okay? That's not really bitterness. <laughs> A little bit of competition coming out. But, but so, um, anyway, so it was, it was a fantastic opportunity. But here's what's really, this might be interesting to the students, that uh, I had just been at the San Francisco 49ers for two years. And I was there when George Seifert was the head coach and Bill, the you know, infamous Bill Walsh, had come back as a, as a consultant to the team. He had retired a couple years before that. And I had had uh, two years, like growing up in the Bay Area and all of that, and the Niner, I was a Niner fan growing up and all of that, might surprise you. But um, I had the opportunity to study in that system, which was a heralded system. They had turned out head coaches and successful coaches, one right after another, and I was thrilled to be part of it. And I got to really dig into the philosophy and the approach and asked a million questions. I, could, I sat with Bill Walsh, timeless uh, opportunities to you know, kind of drill down into why he was thinking what he was thinking. And then I get the, the, the Patriots opportunity. And Robert Kraft, the owner, says, we want the San Francisco philosophy here in, in New England, and that's one of the big reasons why we're hiring you. And, and, here you go, you know. Well, so I couldn't have been happier. I was thrilled to go ahead and bring the philosophy and the approach. But I found out, you know, the 49ers couldn't have done things in more first-class manner than they did. It was an extraordinary organization. They had all those championship years and were fantastic. Well, I get there and I'm organizing the first mini camp that's coming up. And so as we're going through the, the, the you know, the stuff that you got to do, I get to the meals where we're going to feed the players. And so I said, well, we're going to, you know, they're going to have roast beef, they're going to have chicken, they're going to have, the, you know, the food, and just a tremendous, just the way we had done it. And, and, and Robert Kraft gets word of that. He gives me, no, 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 that's not what we do here. No, here we have soup and sandwiches for lunch, you know, and, and, and that's all I had to say. And I went, oh, no, I'm screwed. I'm screwed, you know, right from that, because I, what he thought he wanted and what he was willing to do were two different things. And as the, as the process of understanding the, the pecking order in the organization and, and who was going to select the players and all the things that wasn't made as clear to me as, I sh it, as it should have been when I started was totally different than what I had expected. And it wasn't what it needed to be for me to coach in the NFL successfully. And, and so we had to share the, the, the personnel and the drafting and all that kind of stuff, and it was a mess. So we did the best we could. And so when I'm walking out the door and he says, you know, okay, it's over, um, I was okay. You know, I was okay. One, I knew he didn't know what he was doing, and that he didn't, he didn't really know what he was losing, right. and he didn't really know where he was going at the time. And, and so he, he was a young owner that was going to figure it out, and he hit it great and did Hall of Fame type of stuff after that. Uh, and, and I knew that I still had a lot of good stuff in me because I hadn't given it my best shot yet. 
So that's where that ended. So th this is sort of important. Hard, hard lessons. <laughs> Those are hard lessons. And, and I like the other guys to learn the hard way, but sometimes you just have to. Yeah, actually, th th you know that. The only time you learn about yourself is through adversity and through the hard times. You don't, you don't learn it when everything's I don't totally hard. agree with that, but Well, okay. I mean, you learn, a lot about your, you learn a lot about yourself when you're faced with these. Absolutely. So you had a, a paid period of reflection afterwards, and so is this a time when you, you sort of had some time to crystallize your philosophy. And can you tell us about maybe the book that was most influential and when that eureka yeah. moment came? Well, Glenn and I retired at that time. <laughs> and, and so uh, it was for about 10 months is all we could take it. And it's all she could take of me being home that much. Um, but uh, it, it, about the time that the college season was rounding out, my son was, was uh, finishing his, his, his uh, career at Pitt and we had a chance to go to a lot of games. It was a great year for us. We had a great, great fun. But as the, as the end of the college season wound, started winding down, I knew that it, I could feel the churn and, and the competitiveness. I got to get going. I got to get, you know, I got to figure out what's going to happen next. And just fortunately, somebody had given me one of uh, Coach John Wooden's books, a little blue book that he has. He has a number of books, but that was one of my favorites. And, and uh, I was reading through it, and I got to a part in the book where it said in his 16th year at UCLA, he won his first uh, national championship. I couldn't close that book fast enough. And it just hit me, and I was, I, I was like, I was pissed. I was, I, you know, it, I was just, it, it shocked me that, that it took that long for him. Because I knew the rest of the story. The story, he won 10 of the next 12 years, he wins the national championship. Can you even imagine a team winning college football or college basketball 10 out of 12 years? You can't even imagine that. He did that. And, and the, what hit me so hard was I knew that he was such a unique person and such a, a different type of character in this, in this head coaching role. And he had his own style, his own way, and, and, and he was just so, so almost enigmatic in, the, in his manner uh, that what hit me was that when he finally figured it out, nobody could touch him. He was unbeatable. He, he won years, stepped down, and then he, and he won it his last year and then retires. He steps, out, steps down from being a head coach. A young man still by coaching years. And so uh, it, it hit me that I've got to figure out my program. I've got to get my act together. I've been coaching for whatever it was, almost 30 years or 20-something years at the time, but I still didn't have it nailed. And, and I knew that I wouldn't get 16 years in my next job. I was going to get lucky to get 16 months or something, you know, as the way it had gone for me. So uh, I had to get going. And so I just started writing down everything I could think of that was important to me. And, and, uh, and it was truly a, a, a catharsis. It was just notebook, just everything I could think of from football to travel to camps to uh, motivation to having fun to, I mean, to summer breaks to all spring football, everything I could think of. And out of that came uh, uh, just pages after pages of, of beliefs. And I, and I, I lucked out and, and then I, I wrote down things that really mattered and, that, and I got to what, I, I, for whatever reason, I was writing down only things that I totally believed in. And so rather than things that I thought were important or things that maybe somebody else had told me that was important. Right. And out of that, somewhere in that process, I thought, well, how am I going to define my, if I could, it would really help if I could figure myself out. And that's when I'm a competitor. And I figured out that I competed my whole life. I competed ever since I was a little kid in everything with my big brother from in the streets, whatever. You know, that's all I'd ever done. And so it hit me that, it, okay, if that's, the, if that's real and it felt totally real to me, I could I, I'm totally at peace with saying that I'm a competitor, then the central theme in my program better be competition. And that's where it all started. And, 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 and from that, fortunately, I called a number of schools and they wouldn't call me back. I couldn't get anybody to interview me. And fortunately, uh, Daryl Gross was here at USC and, and he w had been at the Jets and he got Mike Garrett and whoever he had to talk to to get me a, a chance to get interviewed. And by the time I got to that interview, I was going to kill it. And I was so ready to go. And, and so fortunately, uh, not in a happy reception. <laughs> the people, uh, the Trojan family was not real happy with Pete Carroll coming to USC at the time, and they heard about it in a big fashion, but fortunately we had the chance to, to go ahead and, and, and turn this program around. So let, let's talk about that, because there, there's the before and the after. Um, first of all, the, the three rules right now win forever, the three basic rules that apply to your team, can you, can you tell them to us? Of course we can. Okay, you know, let's share those up front. We, I, would like three to, rules. I would like to think that, that those that are here can remember these three rules, okay? Because this, this is the pillar of, of our program. Rule number one of the program is, is always protect the team. Always protect the team is way more than just those words. That's, that's talking to the conscience that it takes to be a team member with us. And that talks to directly to 
the mindfulness that you need to hold on to regardless of what you're doing or where you're going. At all times, you're, you're part of this team. And then sometimes it's going to be you're going to pull a guy out of a fight. Sometimes you're going to make a decision not to hit a guy late on the practice field. Sometimes you're going to make a decision on, in the game field where you don't, you know, you don't hit a guy on the sidelines and, and, and try to take it out on somebody. I mean, it goes across, across the board, but it's always mindfulness about that you are a member of, of a team and that you're always going to protect the team first. Rule number two is totally totally stolen from Coach Wooden. No whining, no complaining, no excuses. This is, this is about uh, self-talk. This is about the way you will present your, your thoughts and the way you'll act in accordance with what's going on in our program. Because it's, self-talk is so hugely valuable when it's, when it's directed properly. And it, the words that we say are, are followed by our actions most, most commonly, and that's so powerful for us. So, we're not going to whine. We're not going to complain. We're, we're going to be only saying positive things that are supportive and, and that, that keep us in the right frame of mind so that we can be strongest and most powerful. And then rule number three is be early. Now, all you're going to, you, know, you all say, well, rule number three is be on time. No, it's not being on time. It's being early. Because being early is about being organized. It's about setting your priorities in order. It's about having a plan. You can't be early by luck very many times. You can sometimes, but you basically have to get organized. And it's so important for us to set things in order, and it is about respect. If you're going to show up early to a class, then that means you probably had to think about it the night before so that you would get yourself in bed with enough time or at least set your alarm that would wake you up so that you could get where you want to go. All part of the showing respect for that, what that event is all about. Now you get yourself organized, you get up in the morning, you know how long it takes you. All of those thoughts are hugely important in, in developing this relationship with what's coming up. And so uh, being early is a lot more than just trying to get in the door before the, the meeting starts. It's about having a, having a plan and, and being organized and having the, the ability to set priorities in order to be, best put you in the best light. And so those are the three rules. That's all we got, and uh, that's all you need. We'll build, we'll build off that. I know Sark has five. I can't wait to talk to him about four and five. <laughs> <laughs> so you talked about the, the opportunity at USC, and uh, the mark of a great entrepreneur or anybody is it starts with a vision and recognizing opportunity, seeing something special where others see problems. So let's just give you a picture of USC before you arrived. In the 80s and 90s, USC finished in the top 10 once. During one stretch, Notre Dame went 14-3-1 against oh, the Trojans, including hurts. an unbearable 11 straight. Oh, that hurts. At the same time, UCLA ran off eight consecutive wins against the Trojans. Can you imagine? The, the team was barely above 500 in the five years before you took over. You were the sixth head coach in 18 years. USC football was a mess. Our spirit was broken. What did you see when you applied for the job? Let me take you a step before that, okay? I, I ran into the coach that was here before me uh, on campus when my daughter Jamie was visiting campus to see if she wanted to go to SC. And, uh, and he said, and I, we're all friends, and he called me up in his office and brought me up to his office and said, I gotta show you something. He opens up the, the middle drawer of his office. First off, all the windows were dark and closed and all that. And he opened up the, the drawer and he showed me, he looked, Here's, here, look at this. Here's the 20 reasons why you can't win at USC. Uh, whoa, you know, I, I, you know, so I went through it with him and all that. And not to take a shot at anybody, but that, that was the vision for the program. Academics were tough. Oregon and Washington had taken over. It, it'll never be the same. The stadium, the facilities, all of those things that were, you could look at those as all being true. And, and that was before I even thought about this. I wasn't even thinking about it coming to this. I didn't know anything at the time, you know. But I remember that, 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 that now that I look at it, that was the vision for the program. And how could you ever get better than that? Well, when I came here, the first things I heard, and when in, in, in the process of getting here, people said, well, it isn't the same. And academics, and I'm telling you, some of, your, some of our great alums were telling me it's not like it used to be. And all I could think was, okay, maybe it isn't like it used to be. I don't know the truth of this, but we're going to take it as far as it can go. That's what we're going to find out. We're going to coach them. We're going to motivate them. We're going to direct this thing. We're going to take it as far as, we, as it can go, and we'll see where that is. That was, that was, I didn't say we're going to win the Pac-10 or go to the Rose Bowls or any of that kind of stuff. That wasn't the thought. It was just, let's see how far we can go if we get as, as good as we can possibly get. And that's where it started. And so uh, uh, at the time, to set the direction of the program once I got the job, it was really to own the Rose Bowl to me. That, that's what this program needed to do. It had done it in the past, and I thought that that was the right, the right vision to hold on to. It wasn't being the number one team in the country, and it, it wasn't even really the Pac-10. You know, it was really, or the, yeah, the Pac-10. It was, it was just about setting the sights on, on something that was much more than one year, 
much more than one ring, much more than one flag that you wave as a championship, and see if we could put that in motion. And, and so we, we fortunately put it, there's a big old sign in the, as you come off the practice field, and there it was, you know, on the Rose Bowl. And, and that's what we set out to do. And, and I, I knew that to do that, you probably have to win the, the conference, and you're going to have to do some great things to get that done, and that, that's, that's really where the direction was set. And so we just took it over and went after it. And, and things turned around pretty quickly, uh, second and third year. Can you talk about the precise turning point in the program when you made a, a very famous proclamation? Yeah, there was a game. We, we were, uh, these stories are fun, but I, won't, I can't tell you all the stories, but we're playing Arizona, and I don't know what the record was at the time. It might have been two and four or something like two and five, maybe two and five. And, and we, we, I'll tell you a little bit about it. We, we drive into Arizona, and Carson Palmer was our starting quarterback. That week, I talked to Matt Liner. I said, Matt, you know, you may get a chance to start this week. You know, it might be time to make a change, you know, so I want you to prepare and get ready and, and all that. So as Matt was all excited about it, he told his dad, his dad gets in the car and he's driving to Arizona, you know, he's going to come to the game and he thinks he's going to start and all that. Well, we get to the, we, we visit the stadium on Friday night before the game and we, as we get off the buses, we're all going to see the, the locker room. It's a horrible locker room, just the worst you've ever seen. And it's about 105 at about 5 o'clock in Arizona. And our guys walk out in the field and they are dead and gone. I mean, they, they don't, they're just listless. They're sitting down. There's no juice. It's just the opposite of what I vision that it's supposed to be like. We're ready to have some fun. We run around on the practice, on the game field, and then we get out of there. We, I couldn't get us back on the buses fast enough. We get back to the hotel, and if the coaches were here, they would remember. I got them together, and I said, I don't care what you do, but tonight, in tonight's meeting, you tell them the most emotional story you can possibly. I don't care if you make it up, true, it doesn't matter. You tell them whatever you got to tell these guys, because we can't, we're going to get killed the way, we're, the way we're going into this night. So guys told stories. Guys are crying. There's, I mean, there's some of the most heart-rendering things you've ever heard. <laughs> I don't think half of them are true, but, but, but we, tried our, we tried our butts off. We had, we had lost, we lost to Oregon on a last-second field goal, I think. We had lost to Washington right at the end, our two Pac-10 games at the time or whatever it was. We're playing this game against Arizona, and we're winning. We're up ahead. We're doing okay. We're, and they start, they start mounting the comeback, and they're, they're starting to come, and you can feel it happening. The momentum has shifted. It looks like they're going to get back in the game, and for all the luck in the world, they, their quarterback stands up and throws the ball in the flat, and Chris Richard, our corner at the time, steps in front, picks it off, runs it back about 60, 70 yards. He, he, he can remember every step of that return because I've made him remember it. So, uh, and we go on, and you could tell that was the play we needed to win the football game. And so we get back in the locker room, and after that, there was, there, for whatever reason, uh, in the crappy little locker room in Arizona. We're all jammed in there. We're really excited about it. Everybody was drained, and it was, it was a great night. I said to him, you know, up until this point, we didn't know. We didn't know. But from now on, we don't have to lose another game. And we had lost five already at that time. So you look at it, we didn't lose very many games from that point forward because from that point, there no longer had to be something that other than a winning football program, and it was a really cool moment. And it, it was uh, in, in our little story and little lore that was really the moment when it turned around. And after that, you, you didn't you didn't lose much. Yeah, you know, th two national championships, three Heisman's, 34 game winning streak. You know, seven BCS bowl games, and it just was. <laughs> yeah, uh, we'll we'll never get tired of saying that. Okay. Um, so it's uh, it, um, let's talk about talent. Uh, the USC stuff we could talk about all night. We don't, we don't have enough time to cover sort of game-by-game -game analysis, which we'd love to do. Um, you look for and recognize uh, great people, right? Um, what do you look for in people? And, you know, if you, uh, you know, the book Good to Great, I think you're a Michael Collins fan, you know, get, get the right people on the bus first, right? Mm -hmm. uh, before players, let's, let's talk about someone near and dear to you. Your, your voice, your thumbs, your is right he going to come man. out right now? Is he, is he, well, no, let, no, no, let's, no. let's bring out uh, USC alum, uh, Daily Trojan staffer, and former hey, walk-on okay. to the uh, USC football team. Let's bring out Ben Malcolmson. Ben. Yeah. You all may recognize Ben fresh off his New York Times article. <laughs> on, uh, this, is, this is virtual Pete. Uh, what did you see? So, Ben, when did you graduate from SC? Hey, Ben, you didn't have to dress up for the night. Jeez. <laughs> I was waiting for that comment. <laughs> he usually has a joke when he sees a shirt that he doesn't like. <laughs> hey, I, I don't have anything that matches with that shirt either. That's so. right. That's right. That's my favorite. I stole your right. line. 
Good to have you here. <laughs> what, what, what year did you graduate? 2007. 2007. Also created, what, what did you create while you were here that you're famous for? Uh, we did a little blog called uscripsit.com and uh, kind of took off and it was at the same time as social media took off. So Coach Carroll, Twitter and Facebook and all that stuff. So, so uh, what year did you graduate again? 2007. 2007. So you're here until 2010. You get a call. What, what did you see in, in this, this guy that made you say he should be with you in Seattle? Well, go, I mean, it goes way back. That's a great story that you know, Ben was a journalism student here, and, and we put out a kind of an all call for tryouts, you know, and, and, uh, and so Ben was a little bit better than the other guys and uh, really caught the ball nicely, you know, ran pretty well and all that. So, you know, and I knew he was a journalism student. You were doing an article, right, for, to, to, you know, follow what it would be like to try out with, with the Trojans. And so I said, what the heck, you know, okay, why don't you stay with us, you know, and come on out for the football team and be, be on it. So, you know, that, that kind of started the whole thing in motion because Ben did a great job of kind of documenting that and, and he did a really good job in, in battling and competing with us and he hung in there and eventually got in the, got in the game and all that. And, and uh, so he, after that, we established a relationship on the USC Ripson thing. That was a really cool thing. I don't think people realized, what, you know, at the time, I didn't know, I had no idea what we were doing, but we just wanted to do something fun and we wanted to see what would happen and could we control the message that was going out better than going through the media, the, the traditional media first. And, and sure enough, it, we, we found a way to do it, you know, and we started to get some following and people were going and Ben was sitting there, you know, right outside my office and, you know, we would just put things up kind of randomly and, and uh, one day he said, hey, hey, there's this thing called Twitter, you know, and, 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 and like nobody ever heard of it, you know, and, and I don't know how, how early it was. And he told me what it was. I said, oh, sure, let's do it, you know. <laughs> we would do anything at the time. We were just trying to play with the whole, you know, with this whole realm of, of the social media stuff. And sure enough, you know, we just, he set in, in motion uh, really a template for, for how schools do it now and how they, you know, they, they set up their, their way of using their social media that still stands. And so when we went to Seattle, you know, sure, you know, of course, if he would come with us, I wanted to have him come. So he's been absolutely integral to everything that we do and in, in all of the communication stuff. And, um, you know, we're, we've, we've had a blast doing this. And so it's really been cool. Oh, well, he's, uh, I mean, you couldn't ask for a finer representative of your office awesome. and of your team. He is the, you know, the, the face to the outside world. He gets everything done. I don't know how you handle all the He's requests. He's a competitor. He, uh, <laughs> and, and just so even keeled and professional, you just forget uh, that he's still a young guy. Can you talk about sort of the, the, the social media part that you've built? Because a lot of our businesses and, and students want to learn that. Yes. So, we, I mean, we started Coach on Twitter. His first tweet was the day Obama was inaugurated. I think the first tweet was congrats to President Obama or something like that. And now, I mean, we're 5,000 tweets later and 926,000 followers. Um, I mean, he's the most followed coach in all of sports. Um, he's still the most followed personality on our team. Uh, Richard Sherman's about to pass him, though. So no way. Might have to get a little competition Always there. compete. You might need to have an interview with Aaron Andrews or something. Yeah. Help you out. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it's, it's been really exciting. It's just, it's fun to do too. I mean, um, a lot of people, I think when it started, everyone kind of laughed it off like, oh, it's just what you're tweeting, what you're eating for lunch and what you did for dinner and it's all that stupid stuff. And it became really serious and it became a great marketing tool. Some people kept it really serious. We've kept it really fun. And it's been awesome. So it really has, it gave us a, a, a vehicle for getting the, the the correct word out on, on, on issues that came up. And we would, you know, we would lead the media in that to make sure that we wouldn't get mis misrepresented. And, and it worked out beautifully and gave us a control that, you know, we, could all, we always laughed about it. You know, they're, they're following us because they have to. <laughs> you know? so it was kind of cool to do that, you know, because we could make them follow us because you never knew when an announcement was going to come out or something was going to be of significance. So it just became kind of a game and we had fun with it. Yeah, to be able to have a direct conversation with your fans and your followers and, sure. and to be able to trust someone so completely that he, he is your voice. I yeah, know that well, no, it, it works great. You know, really, honestly, I, I, I have tweeted a numbers of times, but basically I don't. Ben, hey, let's put this little thing out here. Uh, who's this guy, Macklemore? You know, and that, it, that was kind of how that one started too, you know. And uh, so um, we, he's been absolutely trustworthy to the nth degree, and, and uh, it's, been, it's been a great relationship. Do you want to add something? Do you want to tweet now? I mean, you, yeah, you want to tweet something now directly from, from Pete Carroll? Yeah, yeah. We yeah can, let, let's do put it right now. Do it right now. Yeah, yeah, really quickly. So Ben's so busy that he's got to run to another engagement. So he's going to tweet. Um, you, want, you want to have a little, a little play in this? Go ahead. Well, do you uh, want to get the audience? I mean, what do you want to Well, the, uh, unless you light up the audience. Can you light up the audience for Ben so we can tweet this to their million followers? 926,000. 
926, yeah. Light, light up the audience. Light. There, there you go. go. Everyone say hi. Well, Come on, that's a little bit. Yeah, there you go. Fight on, fight on. There you go. Fight on. Cool. Bovard crowd, there we go. Yeah. Having and, fun. Hey, this is a lot better than going to class, isn't it? Jeez. <laughs> this is class for some of them. Oh, sorry. So just, just before you go, Ben, quick word on sort of, you know, what, what are the things, you know, I'm sure there's a lot, but what have you learned from Pete that you really, you know, has, has sort of shaped your philosophy? That's a big moment right here. Yeah. That's big, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess the biggest thing for me is finding your identity, finding who you are, what you stand for. And uh, I mean, it's a journey, especially like college time, like that's such a huge journey that you all are on, trying to figure out who you are, what you stand for, what you believe in. Um, and it, you can go a million different directions, but the sooner you find that out, the more successful you'll be, the stronger you'll be. Um, it's an amazing thing when you figure out who you are. Um, it took, it takes all, it's a journey for all of us, you know, and it, it definitely takes time, it takes effort, um, but the, the, that's the biggest thing. And then also too, I think you've talked a little bit about it, but just creating value. Um, coach gave me an amazing opportunity seven years ago now. Um, he said, I need a website. Let's create a website. And gave me the opportunity to create value um, for, the, for the university, for the football team, for myself. Um, and it's just been incredible. So something I'll take with me the rest of my life, for sure. Well, it's, it's great having you back. It's great welcoming back a great. Let, let's hear it for Ben Malcolmson. Ben. Great job. Feel good story. He's, he's, he's a sharp guy. He's awesome. He's, he's a sharp awesome. guy. He gets stuff done. Self-made. So let's, let's talk about uh, developing other players and creating a vision for them. Uh, give us an example, you know, Russell Wilson, not your prototypical quarterback. <laughs> Matter of fact, uh, you know, you, you named him a starter shortly after Seattle signed a big contract with somebody else. Yeah. So well, talk about how you developed the vision for him and with him. Well, uh, let me say in general first and then come back that, because I, I think it's if you're visiting with us on this night, I want to make sure we hammer this home, that uh, there's tremendous power in vision. There's tremendous power. When you decide that you are going to uh, create a vision of how you're going to spend these, these five years or four years in college, and you clearly define what that is, as soon as you make that declaration, it's already on its way to happen. It's that powerful. But the practice of staying in connection with that vision and competing to stay on track with what, that, what you had set out for you is what guarantees that you're going to accomplish what you want to accomplish. Well, that, that, that thought is so all-encompassing to me that everybody we deal with is dealt with in that manner. We deal with whether it's Russell or whether it's John Snyder, the general manager. We created an absolute clear-cut vision that we were going to have the best relationship in professional sports. And we we're going to prove that by, by working to get that worked out. And I said, John, we're going to, I'm hoping that this is going to be a famous relationship someday. This is the first night we're talking. And so, uh, and from then, it was my job. I didn't put it on him. It was my job to make that come true. So I was going to reinforce him. I was going to support him. I was going to learn who he was, figure out what was, what was important to him, and do everything I could to make him as strong and powerful as he could possibly be. He's, he, he's going to be arguably the number one GM, you know, in the NFL. And, you know, that puts him in the professional sport. I mean, that, that, it's happened. It's happened. Now, I didn't do that. He did that. He's the one that did it. But we, we collaborated in making this relationship one that would foster that to come to life. So before you talk about Russell or any of the guys, I, I just want to make that, that really clear to you how powerful a tool this is. It is as real as it can get. This is not airy-fairy uh, self-help BS. This is the real deal because there's a real mechanism to it and you have to act in accordance with it and you make it happen. You make it happen. So you, when you pick a guy, Russell, we can't even, Russell is, Russell Wilson is such an amazing person that he already walks in with vision and insight and knowing himself and all, all of these marvelous things. You just got to kind of get out of his way and give him the opportunity to show the world what he's all about. It was, I know it came off like one of the, you know, huge decisions and all this, and we went against, I love the fact that we went against conventional wisdom. <laughs> that was cool. We, you know, okay, conventional wisdom says you don't play a 5'10 guy. You don't even draft him. You don't even give him a chance. And so, I'm sorry, Russ, 5'11. Uh, <laughs> um, and that all came about because John had vision for this kid, that this guy was really unique and special. He showed him to me. I latched onto it, and we rode this thing all the way through the process until we got him to come to our program. Can you imagine the guy picks out of the hat on draft day, 
32 names in the hat. He picks out the Seattle Seahawks, and we draft him three rounds later. How did that happen? I have no idea, but that happened. That was real, and he has become everything that he already knew was going to happen. Russell knew he was going to win world championships. He's told us this is the best decision you've ever made on the first phone call we're talking to him. He knew, so, so he's not a great example of, 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 of he's just the best example also. Um, but let me, uh, let me take a little further. It, all we did was to support him. And what, how you do that is you have to dig in to figure out who that person is and find out what's important to them, things that they might not even have surfaced themselves, you try to bring out. It's what Ben talked about, finding yourself. This self-discovery process is so huge. I was doing it after the blue book, writing all that stuff down. That's when I finally did it. It took me, it took me 30, 40 years, whatever it was, 40-something years of my life to get to that point. It doesn't need to take you that long. You can do this sooner, but you've got to do the work. That's right. And you've got to figure it out. It ain't easy. It's not easy at all. It's very challenging. But we'll talk about it later. We can, we can get that done. But here, here's the cool thing about it. The vision just doesn't apply just to the one person. You can apply it to your team, to a whole body. Treat your whole team as, who are we? You study them, you figure them out, you come to a, a sense of, that you can describe and explain and define them, and then you get them to talk about it. We go through this process of figuring out what are we, what can we possibly be, and now as soon as you get to where they all go, oh, all right, yeah, we can do that, you're rolling. It's already going. You can't even stop it from happening. Now the job is, is to coach them into staying in connection with that vision as, 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 as directly and succinctly and precisely as you can. So where people think this whole thing is airy-fairy and have fun and the soft and fuzzy and all that, they don't get it. They don't understand. This is a hard, disciplined uh, regimen to, to, to undertake to become all you can possibly be. But it's so freaking powerful because we just did it again. You saw it happen when we played Oklahoma. Let me take you back. The night before the Oklahoma game, we, and I know Sark's here, and we, we had won every game. We number one team in the, in the country the whole year. I don't know how many games we'd won in a row, but Oklahoma was the number two team in the, in, in the country the whole season, you know, slated as the biggest matchup in the history of college football and all that. The night before the game, we're talking to the players. I'm saying, I can't think of what I'm going to talk to them that night. This is a cool little story. I, can't, I don't what am I gonna, what, what's worthy of this night, you know? How can I have a big night before the game meeting and get them all fired up? I don't know how, what could possibly be worthy. So I said, I'm just going to tell them what's happened. Let me just take them back and walk them through it. From the first moment we ever met, we said, we're going to figure out how we can be the best we can possibly be. That's, that's what this program's all about. And from this, this point forward, that's where we're going for. Well, here we are on the night, the eve of the biggest college football game in history ever, or whatever, who cares, what, that's what the writers are saying. But that's what they're saying. So what we have done is we have taken a vision of being the best we could possibly be, and we've seen it all the way through to the point where here we are on the precipice of this game, and we already know we're going to win. We just don't know who's going to score the touchdowns. We don't know who's going who's to get the storylines. Where's it going to come from? We know we're going to win. So let's capture the fact that what we had done is we had started with creating a vision, seen it all the way through, and nobody backed off until we stand right here this night before this game. And then let's go, you know, and I was hoping it was going to come through, <laughs> of course. But let's go play the game now. And let's let it rip and hold nothing back. Well, it was about the same Saturday night before whatever, February 2nd. It wasn't any different. It was the same story. It happened again. So maybe, I don't know how many times it has to happen before you believe it and you figure it to be real, but I'm a believer. <laughs> Man, I'm following it because it's happening, well, and it happened were, again. And, and, well, you saw the similarities in the run. You saw the similarities in the demeanor of the team. When we saw your team, you know, on the walkthrough before the NFC Championship game, you're just looking at them. They were, the moment wasn't too big. It was business as usual. You ran your practice exactly the same way, whether it was the NFC Championship game or the Super Bowl, and you looked at them, and they never got too pumped up. They never sort of let the moment get them. And you just felt like this, this, this may not be close if it sort of turns out like the SC thing. But, but the tools you that you that, talk, huh? <laughs> well, I didn't say you knew awesome. it, but I, I was watching it, and like you, know, you, you were nice enough to let us sort of observe it. And uh, it looked exactly the same. But the tools you talk about, you know, in order to do this work, it is not easy. You're sort of you know, eliminating, you know, the limiting, limiting beliefs and aligning your beliefs with your attitudes and habits and actions and, and constantly reevaluating and you know, being mindful of self-talk, all those things, you know, Lou Tice. Pete Carroll type of philosophy, and, and you really have to watch yourself, and you do need outside people to remind you. 
because uh, you're probably your worst critic sometimes. You know, I think it's, I think it's worth mentioning that, that you really can, and as you guys go, go on in, in the business people, and you're all going to be running businesses and in charge of stuff and all of that, you really can, you, you can design the culture of, of, of your workplace. You can totally design it. it, it you got to think it through. you got to figure out what you want it to be. But you can, in the same exact sense, create the vision of how you want that to be and, and, and put together an environment that fosters success and achievement and accomplishment and support and empowering, empowerment and all, you can do that. You, you, you can absolutely create it. You, you, it's alive and well in the Northwest right now, you know, and, and it's really proud of that, really proud to prove it again on, the, on, on this level. And that's, it's, that's why this was such a great challenge. It was why it was a challenge that I couldn't pass up. It was why it, it, if given this opportunity and you could come through and do it, it would be the, the, the best thing we could have done. And in order to do it, I mean, you just think of the amount of work to do it for a team, and then you know you also spend the individual time with each player and each coach to make sure they're developing. So you need great coaches to 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 get the word out and to to reinforce with the players. So many of your assistant coaches have gone on to head coaching jobs, and and you, you love when you help develop that. And you compete like hell when they want to leave. Um, let's talk uh, to one of them um, that is also a head coach. Uh, can we please welcome current USC head coach Steve Sarkisian? Steve. Hello. Thanks for being here. Got to win more games, Coach. <laughs> That's okay. You're my hero. You're welcome, my hero. welcome, Sark. It's Thank great you. to ha it's great to have you here and continuing this this great tradition. You, you talk about sort of some of the things that maybe you developed when when you were an assistant coach, to Pete, that you've helped maybe build into your philosophy. Wow. I don't know. <laughs> You can say yeah, hi first. You can that's say a lot. I, I will say there's one moment that stands out to me first and foremost. And we talk about the 34-game winning streak and all that. I, I remember the night that that streak got broken. Uh, we were in Corvallis, Oregon, and we lost a, a really tough ball game there. Right there, there at the end, it was 33-31. And the offense had five turnovers in that game. And I felt miserable, right, the, the, is the guy working with the offense, and that didn't go well. And as soon as we got into that coach's locker room, and it's one of the – more crummy locker rooms in our conference. It's about on par with Arizona. Uh, coach came right up to me and said, Sark, this is what I'm going to say to the team. This is how I'm going to say it. This is the stuff I'm going to focus on, and this is how I'm going to bring it back. And he had been preparing for this speech for probably, I don't know, Coach, how long? I mean, I don't know how many, how many where do you think you're going to win 30-something games? Yeah, in I know. You know, <laughs> that, the speech has just been I, over and over. On it. The speech gets done. I'm still feeling crummy. He comes right back to me in my locker again to talk more about why he said what he said, how he built the team up at the end. And I think that was just indicative of the preparation that this guy puts into place. You know, I think so many times um, we see all the, the smiles and the hugs and him having fun, which is an unbelievable mannerism in, in, in who he is as a person. Uh, but there is a lot of hard work in there. There is a lot of dedication. There's so much preparation. There's so much contingency planning that takes place, and he was prepared for every moment for whatever was around the corner. He's always expecting something good around the corner to be there, but for whatever might be there, I think that's the biggest thing that sticks out to me is the preparation so that you develop the knowing that you're worthy of winning, that you're worthy of being successful, that you're worthy of being in a position of, of having that belief, of having that confidence, of, of knowing you're in that position to be successful. So I, I thought that was a really cool moment for me as a, as a young coach who uh, I had countless talks with him, but that one really stood out to me. And what did you see in this young man that, uh, that made you uh, put him in charge of the offense and calling plays at, uh, at USC? He was really a good computer salesman or something, whatever you were. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you were doing before, but it, was, it wasn't ball. But uh, it was the, um, his, his agile mind uh, and, and ability to, um, uh, to think freely and openly, um, a clarity uh, with people, um, to understand people and who they are and what they're all about. Very flexible. Um, you know, and his makeup is he can handle all situations. He never feels uncomfortable. Um, you know, the fact that he was a great quarterback in college and, and, a, and a big time baseball player and all that growing up, all of those things added to it. But, uh, but he had a, a real global sense of handling situations that, that separated him from other people. Not everybody can do that and think that way, and, and Sark's great at it. And so I never thought, I mean, 
from early on, I tried to get the, the administration here to guarantee that he would be the next coach when I was leaving, you know, if I, if I got kicked out of here or whatever, and because I, I saw it that early in him, and so I, I really, I'm thrilled. I'm just thrilled that you have this opportunity because he gets it. He knows what SC is all about. He knows what it is to, to work in Southern California, and he understands the landscape of this conference and college football, and he's going to do a great job, and I don't have any doubt in, in saying that. Coach? So, and we, we can already see that you're off to a great start. You had a great, uh, you know, recruiting season. Heck yeah, man. Great people coming. Congratulations. Knocked them in a boat. It was awesome. <laughs> but the, the, the flip side of, of college players maybe versus pros is, you know, younger. And the, the challenge is that they're younger, but the advantage is that they're younger, maybe more pliable. I don't know if you say that. But, you know, you know what's been your experience so far? You've been in the job for a few months. Well, I, I think this, I was, I was listening to Coach back there, and, it's been an amazing ride so far, up into three months on, on the job. Um, one thing that we've really tried to shift culturally in the minds of our players, our coaches, the people on this campus, our administration, I think so much of the focus for the past three years has been on the sanctions. Um, the, the, our numbers aren't as, as, as much as everybody else's. The, a little bit of the woe was me. And when, when you paint that picture and that's the talk, ultimately your image that you create um, that becomes you. And so we've really tried to make it a point that it's not about the 70 scholarship players that we have. It's about how talented those 70 players are that we have and what we're really capable of doing. And uh, I think that's been a real piece of this that I think if you talk to our players today, three months into it, working with our strength and conditioning staff, just really getting to know our coaches right now, that that's, that's one of the pieces. We're, we're not dwelling on that. We're not dwelling on what we can't do, but, but rather what we're capable of and what we can do. And I think that's been the real big piece for us, whether it's in recruiting, putting the schemes together, developing a staff, working with the players, off-season conditioning, getting ready for spring football in about a, about a week and a half. That's been, the focus has been on what we can do, not, not so much what we can't do. Well, huge. we're uh, huge. We're, we're so fired up to see what you guys can, can put together this year. You've got a lot of people behind you. We're so thrilled to have you back, and it just worked out perfectly. Welcome I back, Chief Sarkisian. Thank you, guys. Thanks, buddy. Okay, okay. Thanks for doing this, Steve. I'll see you. Yeah, it's really exciting. It's, it's so exciting. It, it, I, I'm so happy that, that really that everybody gets a chance to get Sark in this program. It's gonna, they're going to do great. And, and everything, it takes time. It takes a process. But he, he, you get his focus about always what you can become. And, and what, that's, that's exactly what you want to be focusing on, I think. Yeah, you, and you've also developed, in, in addition to, to coaches uh, mm -hmm. that you've developed, players that may not otherwise have attracted attention from other teams, and other coaches, you seem to find not just the gems, but you work with them and develop them. Can you, and someone who is very unique, can you tell us, um, even though uh, he went to a, a school that wears uh, uh, baby blue and pastel gold, can you tell us why we should know and love Derek Coleman? Yeah. Um, I don't know if everybody knows the story, but Derek at age three lost his hearing and uh, um, we, we recruited him. I think Troy High School, I went and saw him, and I wanted to make him a fullback, and he didn't want to do it, you know. And uh, so he's a fullback now. Uh, <laughs> um, so he went to UCLA and, and, and had, you know, had a, a nice career there. Um, but let me tell you, this is an extraordinary kid, and let me tell you why. Okay, he came into our program. Of course, we wouldn't, we, I wouldn't think that, that why couldn't he do it? And I think maybe that, this would make him more unique and more special, so let's go ahead and give him a chance. He came in, did a great job battling and competing in the program and, and made himself a spot. And I liked him and thought, you know, thought the world of him, like many of our players. But not until during this season, uh, on a Saturday, you know, the Saturday walkthrough that you've been to before, um, we always have some kids or some people come through. And I happened to be shaking hands with, with a family and this one deaf young, young man, probably about a 13-year-old kid. And I said, well, he's got, you know, got to meet Derek. Derek, come on over here and, and, and talk to this, this, you know, this guy. You know? And uh, so I just happened to be standing there. The mom says, this has really been difficult on, on the young man, the, the, her boy, and he hasn't been able to, to really ever get comfortable in the school setting, and he wants to play sports and all that. Is there anything you could tell him? And Derek immediately went to, here's what I want you to do. You go to the team that you're playing for, and you ask the coach if you can talk to the team. And it's going to be hard, but just do this. Just say to the team, 
I'm deaf. I can't hear everything, but I can read lips, and I, and I can communicate. Sometimes I may need your help a little bit, and that's it. And that kid's eyes just opened up so, and, and that, I mean, to think of that moment with the kid looked up at his mom, looked up at Derek, and gave him a big hug, that, he, that Derek had handed to this kid probably the tools that's going to help him make it through his life and be successful. He's no longer going to be afraid to say that he's a deaf kid and that he's different than somebody else. This is who I am, and will you just... So there's going to be a time I may need to ask you to repeat something. And it was, and I've, we've gotten letters from the family and the whole thing. And that's Derek. And he, he is, uh, you know, he's going to be an extraordinary force in helping a lot of kids that are otherwise, you know, you know have an unfortunate issue. And, and uh, he's going to help them make it not an issue. Yeah. Uh, and very you've cool. done, uh, uh, you're also known for doing a lot of that uh, as well. The people that you surround yourself uh, by and program and your involvement when you were here. You know, we, we remember so many great people that you brought into the USC family. Some of them are here. I know Jake Olson and his family are here. I mean, Jake here? Jake here? Jake, you out Jake's there? Jake's here. Jake's here. You know Jake's here. What's up, Jake? You know it. So, Jake, I can see you as well as you can see me right now. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, I, I had uh, the pleasure of sitting. Great that you're here, buddy. I had the pleasure of sitting with, uh, with him and his family at the Super Bowl and just insisted that they, they, they come here. But you always bring great people into the program, and we're so thankful <clears throat> that they're part of the USC family now. But let's talk about other things that you do with your program. We talked about core values. But we left something out that's a big part of your program. <clears throat> Fun, music, spontaneity. At USC, you brought in everyone from Snoop Dogg. You jumped off the high dive at the end of practice. Uh, you brought in Will a couple times for Who? multiple roles. Who? So, Who? <laughs> Will. Oh, Will. Will Ferrell. So what is the oh, role of, of, yeah. of humor? What's the role of humor? Alum, yeah. but what, what is the importance and role of humor and fun in your program? Well, um, I would think that <clears throat> those kids that are in your class have, a, have an idea about why we are like we are. <clears throat> it, our, our players, much like your students, are in, in a learning setting, and they have to, uh, you know, they have a chance to learn, you know, what you're given. And in, in my classroom, I want to make it one that they want to come to and one that they don't always know what's going to happen. And it's not the old class where they roll off the mimeograph sheets and, okay, let's go through the, you know, item one through ten and, you know, or whatever it is, and it's a boring drudgery of, of learning. To me, it's, it's a chance to engage the learners in every way that I can. So that's really behind everything. We want to win. We want to be great. They have to learn. And so how can we make the learning environment as thriving as, as possible so that when they come, they're tuned in and, and they're turned on and they're ready. And so um, that's really what's been behind all of the, the, the things that we've done. But, all, but the bottom line is you play football. You know, you don't work football. You don't make it through football. You play. And to me, the game's always been the game. And I've always wanted it to be fun. And if we're not having fun, then I'm screwing up. That's the way I've, I've looked at it. And so it's my responsibility to, to find ways to make it uh, a good time for the, and so that they enjoy being there. And they look for it. Our guys want to come to the facility. They like being around what we're doing. The number one tool that I've used is competition. We compete all the time. Guys are doing stuff all the time in our program. We got a, right on the, the side of our our stage that we have in our, there's a, there's a hoop right there, you know, and we, we have shoot-offs all the time. We do all, whatever we can think of. I do like about a five-minute monologue at the start of our, uh, our meetings, you know, and, and show highlights from the day before, the good stuff, the bad stuff, the, the funny stuff that happens in practice, just to get them engaged. When they walk through the door, okay, what's, what's going to happen next? And so that I got them turned on so that, for learning. And that's really what it's all about. And then always with fun. And so, yeah, obviously it's part of who you are, being authentic. If it's not fun, then and, uh, you're doing it wrong. We had Will here in, uh, in October. And who? He was, he was rega Will Farrell, oh. and, and he was regaling us with his, his athletic tales, and you were kind enough to chime in. Can you share, this is one of my favorite stories, before the Michigan Rose Bowl, can you share the story of bringing Will into practice as a surprise and just give us, take yeah, us well, through it, that day? It was right around his birthday. I don't remember what his birthday, but it was right around his birthday, and, and uh, he was begging me to, to just, could I, could I do something to be a part of the Rose Bowl or something? It's my birthday and all this. So I said, okay, you know, we'll do something, you know. So, <clears throat> so about Thursday uh, in, in, of the week, um, I, 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 Wednesday I think it was, I said, tomorrow, uh, we were off school now because we're preparing for the Rose Bowl. And I, I said, one of the guys from the fraternities called me up and said, he can help us play. He said, he can catch a couple passes. He can help us win the Rose Bowl. And so I, I said to the players as, as, as honestly and, and, and uh, straightforward as I could, we're going to let this guy have a chance. Well, heck, we want to win, so let's let this guy have a chance. 
So we go to practice the next day, and, and I said, the new guys will be coming out today. I don't know when he's going to get here. He'll be coming out. So they knew, and I, that was it. Didn't say anything more. They thought I was crazy, first of all, to be bringing in a new player. But as, as luck would have it, he was late. And so the practice had to just keep stretching the practice and stretching the practice. And before it was over, I looked down at the, at the far end of the field down there, and, and, uh, and here comes the, the, um, one of those little carts, you know, coming out. And, he's, and there's the player all dressed up wearing, I think, number 85, you know, and coming out, and, and, and he's, he's got his helmet on, his full gear, you know, and I said, and we look at him, you know, and they're, they're looking, here comes a new guy, you know, okay, we're going to put him in right now, and they couldn't quite tell where they're all squinting at him, you know, and he's coming out, and I said, I think that's Will Farrell. I think that's Will Farrell, you know, and so I said, okay, we're in, let's go, we got a little uh, uh, A26 uh, uh, Amigos, uh, you're, you're at the split end position, let's go, 85, get in and show us what you can do, <laughs> and right then he gets in the huddle, Matt Liner calls the play, ready break, the defense is out there, and I thought, oh, God, I hope they don't hit him. And so, <laughs> <laughs> as good luck when fortune would have it, he lines up at split end, takes off, Matt drops back, lobs the ball up there as soft as he could throw it so that he could have a chance. He's underneath it, he's falling one way, he's falling the other way, and somehow he got the ball and hung on and fell down <laughs> in, in, a, in a circus catch for him. And uh, it showed that that lack of athleticism, you know, that... <laughs> The, the no speed, no talent, you know. Oh, but, hold you know. on, hold on, hold on one second. You know what? You know what? I was just, I was just hanging out in the hallway <laughs> and uh, I'm like, that sounds like Pete Carroll in there. <laughs> I thought I'd listen, and you're talking crap about me. <laughs> Dang, that was an athletic catch. If you remember, <laughs> I was completely underthrown, <laughs> and I had to cradle it in. <laughs> right? Right? Please right. welcome USC alum Will Farrell. What's up, buddy? <laughs> Welcome back. This is uh, what's that? This is my Super Bowl ring. <laughs> I don't even have one. Yeah, yet. you don't have one yet. Uh, this is a prototype. This is what they're gonna look like. I know like what you're thinking. Foil. It looks, looks like, like foil. Looks like but, a uh, foil. <laughs> these are forty-eight thousand dollars a piece. I like, yeah. <laughs> I like your hat. Do you mind if I sit in? Please sit down. <laughs> Please sit down. I'm not gonna say a word. Continue. Hey, hey, Welcome I, back. I like your khakis. These are my tight pants. You said wear my oh, tight pants. Yeah, yeah. We could go a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> good to see you, man. How are you good doing? To good you to too. see you. We were just talking about your athletic uh, e exploits. What have you been up to? You been, uh, <laughs> how'd, your how'd your team do this year? <laughs> how'd we do this year? Yeah. Well, we won the freaking Super Bowl, dude. No, we come on. Yeah, we did. Really? Yeah. Did you really think that approach, that California, West Coast style would work in the pros? Uh, I'm the only one who did. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wow. Well, that's congratulations, though. I appreciate it. Thanks for being here. You know, uh, uh, oh. <laughs> so do you want to take issue? Fit. You want to take issue with it? You know, not just well, the description, but you were, you were a fine player in, in high school. You were a kicker. I was a kicker. <laughs> you were a kicker. <laughs> Place kicker. No wonder. Come on, come on, let's kick one, let's go. Come on, take a seat. Come on. Hold the oh, get the house lights up. Get the house lights up. Get the house lights up so someone can catch this. I need to, uh, Sidewinder, a friend Herrera. Get it up. Yeah! Oh. Yeah! See? Woo! Awesome. Tell, uh, <laughs> yeah. Top deck. Tell, uh, Ed, we're, we're, we're going to need that back. <laughs> we're going to need that, that back. That comes out of the budget, right? Yeah. <laughs> tell Hauschka I'm gunning for him. Yeah. Hauschka's scared to death now. Yeah, yeah. He should that. be. He's yeah. coming after him. It took us three weeks to get that kick up there. I want you to know we've been practicing. We've <laughs> been here. That's impossible. Well, the thing I always wondered, you, know, yeah. you were always trying to, you always wanted to compete with me, you know, and, and, I, and I, I kept telling you, you don't have to, you know, we don't have to do these things, and sure enough, you wanted, I know you had a little swimming in your background or something, right. so we have that big one-on-one -on -one swim meet, you remember that one? We, we have this, we, we race across the pool, and we where come I, back, I, you know. Where I let you win. And, and yep. 
Yeah. And I'm in my nice little suit, and you're in your speedos. Which you didn't have the guts to wear speedos. <laughs> you're right. Uh, do, yeah. do, you're right. I, do we have a picture from that? Do we may have a picture of that? <laughs> 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 See, that's a that's the body of a kicker. Right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, but just to let you on the inside, we go down. We, he's talking smack the whole time <laughs> before we hit the water. We we go down and then we turn. We, we turn and come back, and he yeah. breaks into the breaststroke, and then it's like the backstroke or whatever. And the first thing he says when he, when we get to the other side is, "What's my time? What's my time?" <laughs> And, then, and obvious, it was obviously, I said... Four minutes and 37 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> I said, I, I'm sorry, Will, that you, know, that, that you didn't get a chance to win. And he I said, know. well, it was in my Speedos, it was a little too much drag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, you can tell I didn't shave. You know. <laughs> so that's, that's not like my trial time or anything. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's another 20 seconds that's right there. Easily. Just for the body hair. Well, no, that's, that's like three minutes of drag right there. <laughs> So you guys had some. But that great was our uh, that was our first uh, competition moment, right yeah, there. Yeah, it was it was a good one. Yeah. I, I, sorry, you had to lose. And, and you guys have had you had a great time over the years. You were a frequent contributor between Ricky Bobby and Ricky practice. Bobby showed up. Yeah, uh, Ricky Bobby Captain was Compete. Awesome. Ricky Bobby fooled me, and I didn't know that was happening. That was a surprise. Out of nowhere, all of a sudden, we hear. A, a, yeah. I was trying to get you to come on by, I didn't, and all of a sudden, I hear this. We're in our team room, and you hear this motorcycle just ripping in the, you know, just revving it up. Inside Heritage and Hall. And comes running in in full gear, helmets on, mask down, the whole thing, and, and the Ricky Bobby thing, which was awesome. That was great fun. That was good. Captain Compete. Captain Compete, which a lot, I think I scared a lot of the players with the, my the, Captain Compete. That was, that was a scary moment for yep. many of us. Yep. Because Coach had asked me to show up. You kept talking about he's, you know, he's doing this whole compete thing with uh, his <laughs> team, and would Captain Compete, would I want to be Captain Compete. He was like, what does Captain Compete wear? And he said, just figure out something. So I think I bought a, a child's Iron Man costume. <laughs> and then once again, wore a Speedo. You, and uh, you know, One thing about the Speedo, yeah. we, when we call the whole team up, he reaches into his Speedo and pulls out these, these orange socks and hands them to me. <laughs> and I thought, what am I going to do with this? But, or as, as many of the players that were laughing, there were just as many staring at me going, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, I wish we could practice as opposed to listen to you as captain. Let me just tell you real quick what, what he did. He, we're in, we call the team up, we're about ready to call off practice, and, and one of our coaches goes, look, 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 and there's some, a guy on the, uh, had, on the scaffold, a, the, the, the scaffold, filming scaffold, scaffold yeah. and the guy falls off the scaffold and behind the fence, so we don't see him hit. And, and the players gasp, they don't know what happened. And, and m moments after, he comes running in with the guy in his arms. Carrying the like guy. He, like he <laughs> caught him. And, and yeah. He just happened to be on the spot and he caught him. And so uh, you know, he, he, he's doing all this kind of stuff. And just then, one of the, one of the little uh, equipment carts explodes in right. fire. Right. And, and you're supposed to take a bucket of water and run around and pour it. And, yeah. and you couldn't get the top of the bucket. I couldn't get the, the top of the bucket. Yeah. <laughs> and then I was supposed to give <laughs> inspirational uh, 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 words to the team, and uh, I, r I ran out of steam completely. <laughs> There's only so many ways you can articulate how to compete. <laughs> he did so, great, so, uh, so. And I think I just... Uh, but then I then there was one other time, here we were in, in, at the Seahawks, and I don't know, we are playing Chicago or something like that, and we're having our Saturday night meeting, in, uh, and, and, and we had... Playing the, the Saints. Was it, oh, the Saints, okay, yeah. we're playing the Saints down in New Orleans, yeah. okay, there we go. Yeah. And, and we're having the meeting, and the doors bust open, and he, and he comes running in, I'm the new L5 on this team, which is the guy that is the wedge breaker on the kickoff team. <laughs> it's the wedge breaker. <laughs> <laughs> if you're wondering, L5 is the wedge breaker. That was a good one. That was a good one. Anyway, so. You've got, uh, you've got some, uh, something happening tomorrow. Uh, Anchorman yeah, 2 being re-released, and why is this different and better than ever tomorrow? Oh, oh, yeah. I, 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 uh, well, actually, uh, Friday. Friday. Friday, sorry. 28th, Friday. That's okay. Right. We wouldn't want anybody to show up early. No, don't no. show up. Yeah. Uh, Form a line. You can. Form a line. Uh, Fandango. Yeah. Right? <laughs> isn't, that a, isn't that a ticket site? Yes, exactly. Okay, good. So what's that on, on Friday? <laughs> L5, <laughs> Fandango. <laughs> Those are the two things you want to take away from tonight's. Uh, no, we are doing uh, something that I don't think a studio has ever done. We're re-releasing Anchorman with <laughs> 753 new jokes. So we shot so much footage 
uh, on for Anchorman 2 that we literally have enough jokes to do an entirely new movie. <laughs> this is not a joke. And uh, even though they're new jokes, this is not a joke. Uh, so we're, they're just going to release it in a thousand theaters for a week and for, for, the, for the real fans. And, and, and there's a musical number, right? There's hear. a musical number in it. And um, do the fans have to pay for this movie? Yes. They will no. have to pay for it. <laughs> okay, yeah. well. Yeah. And then also, uh, b before you go, I, I know you have to run. Um, tell us about what's happening, uh, Craig Pollard's here, with Cancer for College. Where's and Craig? you got a big event coming up Monday and Tuesday. We'll, we'll, we'll get Craig in a minute. What, what's happening Monday and Tuesday? Uh, Monday and Tuesday, we're going to be out at uh, Indian Wells, and uh, we're going to have a uh, golf, uh, uh, golf tournament and then uh, a, a, a tennis exhibition on Tuesday where uh, we'll be raising money for Cancer for College, and uh, I'll be playing... Uh, Who are you playing? <laughs> I'm going to be playing doubles with uh, Novak Djokovic. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> uh, and then... Uh, uh, versus Kevin Spacey and Stan Wawrinka, who just won the Australian Open. So, <laughs> Kevin Spacey, huh? If you want to blow off class and drive out to Indian Wells and watch some excellent tennis, <laughs> that's the place to be. I can and picture you as McEnroe, kind of a little McEnroe. I, I'm, I'm going to go with the... Go Sherman the on him or something yeah. like that? Go yeah. Sherman. That's a uh, semi-pro look. Um, before you leave, where, can someone get that football back to us? We need that football. Don't for this. throw it at us. We can't see anything. <laughs> Just but before Will goes, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get hold that guy, yeah, up, that there. guy up there. We want we get let's go get that guy right there. Before yeah, you go, how do I get up there? Get, get your cameras ready right now. Here's your moment. Never before seen. Will strike a slow Heisman pose oh, for everyone at USC. Get Which it. Which hand is it? I don't know. There it is. Yeah. Get it. Get it. Get it. Get it. <laughs> tweet it. Tweet it. Will Ferrell, everybody. Oh, Will Ferrell. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate it. See you, David. Stay for the end if you can. Will Farrell. <laughs> All right. That's awesome. We, 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 we couldn't have you here without, That's awesome. That's you know, so cool. you, you, you Skyped in for his, so payback, you know That's what they awesome. say. So we had to bring him back. Let's talk, uh, let's talk Seahawks and Super Bowl before we <laughs> open up for a, a few student questions. Um, okay. Let's talk about sort of what's new. Um, hmm? you, you, you talked about the road leading to the Super Bowl and the Seahawks. Um, the philosophy obviously does work in the pros. It translates, um, and, and, and as evidence of that, <clears throat> There was a recent poll before the Super Bowl, not after the Super Bowl, before the Super Bowl that asked all NFL players which head coach would they like to play for the most. And you were the overwhelming choice of that. So Pete is... I don't know what that... Other, other, than, other than free agency, I don't know what that gets you. It might help us a little bit. <laughs> <You're>... <laughs> Car keys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now the rest of the time we're here, we think he's going to walk out, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> he's totally got us. <laughs> um, where were we? So we're talking about uh, that you know, all, all the players want to play for you, but oh. let's, let's talk about, before we talk about what's new, I, w I want to talk about the 12th man and the bond that you've built, not with just this city and this region. I, I went to... We got a couple 12s in the house. There, there. there are a lot of 12s. There are a lot of 12s. And, I, and I'll tell you, I've never seen anything like it. For the NFC Championship game, and, and anyone who's been to Seattle, they've got this beautiful stadium that's walking distance from downtown. So you leave your hotel, walk to the game, walk through Pioneer Square, and on the way back, it was a nonstop line of people in the bars and the restaurants high-fiving, hugging each other. It was like you know, the end of the war. Remember the pictures of people <laughs> dipping people and kissing girls and everything? It is an unbelievable thing that you've built. Can you talk about the importance of that bond and how you've cultivated that? Well, uh, you know, it, was, it had already been long started. It was un underway before we got there. They had the King Dome back in the day, which was a great uh, venue to play. When you played the Huskies, I know that the Huskies stadium was always crazy and loud, and it shouldn't have been because it was all spread out now to you know, be redone and fixed and all. But uh, there was always a spirit about them. And, and um, 
our owner, Paul Allen, had connected. He had made a tremendous decision being of the area. He wanted to celebrate the fans. And years ago, he, he started raising the 12th man flag uh, in honor of the, the fans just prior to the opening kickoff and recognizing the 12s and all of that. And so th there was already a relationship started. But um, one of the things, you know, to me, I, found, I felt like connecting with the following is another way to engage the supportive elements of, of, of our team. And just like when we spent so much time getting on the road and, you know, and getting out on to, to meet our fans here at SC and to, and to hang with them and meet them and, and bring them into the program, I felt like that's, that's another added advantage if you do it well. They know the language, they know how you talk, they support you properly, they, they can go with you when things aren't as good and they can jump up and down when things are good, when, when things are really going well. Um, so it was, I thought it was another way to help us win. Anyway, so we just, we've had, you know, events to celebrate them and we've done everything we can with the fans to do that and they've done an amazing job. To, and the, the end of it was uh, at least 700,000 people turned out in the streets of Seattle for the parade uh, a couple days after the game. It was the most heartwarming, spirited love fest that you could ever imagine. Nobody got in trouble, peaceful as can be, perfectly handled. Kids left school, they, you know, the, the whole thing. It was awesome. It was exactly what you want. So. Um, I did get in trouble for saying that. You said that. Yeah, you I said that. they should you know, close the schools. They should close they? the schools down. And so all the kids that let let out, I had to write them a note. Um, <laughs> but uh, so it was just it's just an amazing it's an amazing environment. And we broke a world record for the loudest crowd, in the, you know, anywhere. And I don't know. It's like the uh, flux capacitor the little <laughs> unit that they use to measure that. So I'm not quite sure how that worked. But um, and you registered on the Richter scale. Yeah, there's the, some of all that. Stuff. The, so the there's thing, some lore. There's some lore to this whole relationship. It's, it's very, very powerful. And that city. I mean, when when I went up there for the NFC Championship game, I mean, they had construction signs. You know, the flashing signs that say construction or detour. They said danger, Russell Wilson. They <laughs> yeah. said when we went to board after the game. Gotta love Alaska Airlines. The announcement comes over. We are now pre-boarding all those with number three Russell Wilson jerseys, <laughs> followed by anyone in Seahawks gear. <laughs> and it was, it was for real. And I'm sitting next to a guy waiting to board, and he's in a Kaepernick jersey. And just turned to him like, you're probably going to get bumped. <laughs> <laughs> but that city is just uh, in love with the Seahawks. Yeah. And, uh, you it's know, a maybe marvelous it, relationship. It's, it's, it's something yeah. that you've really built. Final question before we open up for a few student questions is, you know, what's new? What are you learning? that you can sort of add on to the latest? Well, you're either competing or you're not, you know, and so we're always looking, and you might, you might think that we feel like we've got it made and we've got it all wired and, and all that, but that really wouldn't be competing. And, and uh, just for instance, in this off season, um, something, I, I cranked on a, a TED Talks and found this, this woman was talking, a woman named uh, Angela Duckworth, Dr. Duckworth, and she was talking about something that, that really, I didn't hear the start of it, I didn't hear the introduction, I just, I don't know how it happened, but I was listening to partway through it, and she was talking about a thing called grit. And I think it's worth mentioning uh, to, to the students, uh, you know, that are out there, that there's some stuff here that's really, really crucial in, as you develop to become what you're going to become. And what she was talking about was the most successful quality that a person could have, not intelligence, not a million other things, not where they come from, not their background, any of that stuff, was grit. And grit is defined as, as passion, perseverance, uh, the, the ability uh, to, to stay on task, um, uh, positive, r relentless, you know, those type of words in, in accomplishing their tasks, uh, good finishers, um, and and as he was talking about that and the perseverance and the passion, I'm thinking that's, that's, what, that's what we're, tr we try to, we're trying to develop that. And she gets right to the end of the speech and she says, but um, we haven't found the way to uh, cultivate grit. And uh, what are you talking? And, and that was the end of her talk, in TED Talks. And just kind of like she's going, oh, I'm like, grit, this is a great thing. And uh, you're going to tell us how to do it. And she says, but we have in the in laboratory, and she's a scientist, we haven't found the ways to, to cultivate grit. And so... Ben, Ben, did get, let's find this lady. Let's get her on the phone. And so within about 15 minutes, we got Angela Duckworth on the phone. And, and so I said, why did you say that? Why did you let everybody off the hook? We're talking about this marvelous quality that people could, could have and, and develop towards them, you know, adding to their success in their, in their careers and whatever. And she said, well, we really, we just, we can't prove it. And I said, well, come out and watch us. Because what we do all we do is try to help people be great competitors. 
That's what we're trying to do. And, and, and we've been teaching competitiveness for a long time and developing it and watching the story after story of people change. She just didn't have our laboratory. She, she, didn't, she didn't have the, the environment that we had to do it in. And, and, uh, and so th that was such a powerful thought to me that we, we really went after this whole thought about grit. We studied and we worked at it. And, and it, it became just a reinforcement to what we already knew as competitors. Let me help you with something. You hear me, we, I, we said com compete a thousand times already tonight. You may think that the definition of competition has to do with uh, um, striving against something. That's probably, kind of, you, you think of it as us against the Broncos, or you think of it as you against the other person. Uh, that's a pretty traditional, updated, I think, thought of what c competition is. And a lot of people think that competition, that's, that's such a becoming thing. You know, you're too competitive, you, you push too much, you're, you're pushy, you, all that kind of stuff. That's not our definition of competition. To us, it's striving for something, which is really the old Greek definition of the word compete, as I've been told. And uh, uh, the striving for is all the difference in the world. So what we're competing is to be the best we can be. What we're competing is to have as much fun as we can possibly have. It's for, not against. In our program, and again, we champion competitive opportunities and moments and illustrations always. Somebody does win and somebody does lose, but that's not what it's about to us. It's about working to become the best you can be. And if you can picture it, if you can picture like our nose tackle, Brandon Mebane, going against our center, Max Unger, every day in practice, day after day, and we set up drills where they have to go against each other and they pass rush and work against each other. If you thought of it about who was winning and who was losing, you'd miss the whole point. You see, Brandon Mebane makes Max Unger by the way he works him and challenges him. And, and Max makes Brandon Mebane by forcing him to be better or he gets his ass kicked day after day. And they don't want that to happen. And it's really the guy across from us that makes us who we are. And, and so when, if, you did, if I didn't talk about it, they wouldn't know that. They'd think about it, just trying, I gotta win, I gotta lose. They would know that, but we talk about it enough and they come to an appreciation of why they compete. They're competing to be the best they can. And those guys across from them are the ones that make them so they love that guy across from them. They have an ongoing relationship with that person because I know that you're making, making me perform at my best. And, it, and there's such depth to when that bond is finally understood. And guys don't understand it right away. They don't get it. But in time, we, we work our way through it. And really what we're doing is we're just trying to make them more gritty. We're trying to teach them how to persevere. We're trying to illustrate to them how they can demonstrate more passion. Let me give you a first-hand example. For those of you that follow us, you may know that Earl Thomas is a great free safety. He's one of the best guys in the, in the NFL. He's a great player. He is the most competitive, gritty guy you could ever imagine. He is never not on. He's always on. And he pushes and practices with marvelous intensity, focuses, studies, does everything. We have a player playing corner that, that you've heard of the Legion of Boom. Okay, well, there you go. L.O.B. Okay, L.O.B. really was these, these four guys that came together. Brandon Browner got suspended, went off the reservation, got screwed up, and no longer with us. Well, where is the L.O.B. going to be now? Well, this young guy named Byron Maxwell, a guy that we drafted in the fifth round uh, from Clemson, was a happy-go-lucky, easy-going guy, nice athlete, nice performer, tough guy and all that, but just was kind of going along with the flow for his first, first two years with us. But something happened. He finally saw Earl Thomas. He'd been practicing with him for over almost two years. And then one day, it finally, he finally recognized who Earl Thomas was. Earl was just being Earl. And he decided, I, I, see, I see where he is. He's at the top of his game. And he, he, he demonstrates in so many different ways what he's all about, and, and, that he competes in battles and does everything exactly the way we'd hope him to do it. Byron just kind of started following Earl around. And he started eating better. Earl, impeccable nutritionist. He, he found out about how he could, he could develop better sleep habits. He came to the meeting rooms early with Earl and started just, and, and if you noticed in, the, in our run this, this season, Byron Maxwell played like an all-pro, extraordinary football player through the finish of our season, came off the bench to do that and played it, it, as a great competitor plays with true grit. He got beat in the game, comes right back, makes an interception right after. He got beat in the Niner game, down there, comes right back, makes an interception next year. Unbelievable connected uh, uh, athlete. 
because he became gritty. He became the great competitor. He was just one of the fellas for a while. So, and it happens in so many varying degrees. And, and here's, the, here's the point. As you go through your challenges here at school and as you come, come upon them, this thing about grit's real. And it is about competing. And it is about pushing yourself. It is about striving, striving to be at your best. And what's, what's really exciting about this is nobody else controls this but you. You are in control of this. You are the one that has the power to make yourself as valuable as you can be. You see, you have this opportunity to create your own value here in the classroom, here in your fraternity, at your dorm. As you get your jobs and have your opportunity, there's a lot of kids graduating from schools that are complaining about there's not enough good jobs. Well, you know what I say about them? They don't get it. They don't understand. It isn't about the quality of the job. It's about the quality of the job you do. You see, uh, you are the one that goes into that workplace, regardless of where you start, and shows to them that they can't operate without you because you work too hard, because you care too much, because you're going to do the little things. You're going to do the extra job that, that somebody else wouldn't do. Bill Russell, a wonderful ba basketball player who's visited with us, lives in the Seattle area, learned it from his father. He said, you're going to do $3 work for a $2 job. You, that's, that's the idea. And that's creating and being in control of your own destiny and your own future. So it is what we have come here to, when we shared with the students here, is to try and tap into. We think we have something to teach you that you're not getting taught in a lot of other classes. And we are looking for this opportunity to share this idea with that you have marvelous talent and marvelous ability that goes somewhat untapped sometimes. And sometimes you're just not ready for it, and that's okay. But when you are ready, and you are ready to go ahead and battle, let's get a little more gritty. Let's compete a little bit at what you're doing. Let's take control of your world. Nobody else controls your value. You do. And if you, if you embrace that, man, there ain't nothing can stop you. There ain't nothing that can stop you. So that, that's that how we continue great. to learn. Take a couple questions. Sure. We're going we're gonna to take a couple questions from students, current students. My class would Let's be great. Let's to do this. Thank you so much for coming to campus. Uh, I think a lot of people may not be aware of the picture that was taken with you and, and Will Ferrell was taken at a Swim With Mike event. Could you talk a little bit about what Swim With Mike means to you, about your involvement? And I'd like to close by saying we would love to see you there April 5th. <laughs> right. Thanks. Appreciate it. Really, really, uh, as I understand Swim With Mike, was an event that started a long time ago, uh, an idea that started a long time ago to give kids a chance to get to school that might not have got the opportunity otherwise. They had some kind of circumstance that, that set their life in a, in a, on, on, down a, an unpredictable road. And uh, this, this scholarship effort um, seeks out special stories and, and, and special people to give them an opportunity to do extraordinary things. And uh, so we've had a chance to contribute. You know, as you saw Will, and, and we've all done it over the years, and I don't know what you know about it, but it's a marvelous program. Jakey, are you part of that program? Jakey, you going to get to school here someday? There you go. There you go, Jake. I hear you, brother. You're going to be a Trojan, too. He is one of those guys. It's just a marvelous program, so it was great to be part of it. And we'll try to get down here. Thank you. All right, next question. Hi, Coach. Thank you so much for coming down to USC tonight. Uh, my name is Donish, and my question for you is, um, out of all the accomplish accomplishments that you have had throughout your career, what are you most proud of? Well, um, I'm most proud of my family, first off, and I take that as a real accomplishment. And I'm most proud wow. of the, the wonderful wife I have, Glenn. Where's Glenn tonight? Hey, babe. Yeah. Most proud. But, but I will say, I will say this. Let me, let me say it. one. One other thing I will, I will add to that, that in terms of the work, the work stuff that we do, I'm most proud that we were able to do what we did here at SC and go up and show that we had something that was of value uh, in the NFL. Really proud of that. Yeah. In the same fashion. What do we got? Hey. Uh, hi, Pete. Uh, my hey. name is Murhawi. Um, I what, is, what is your name? Murhawi. Murhawi. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I want to say, wow, first of all. Uh, thank you for I would just say Murhawi. <laughs> <laughs> Tweet it. <laughs> Tweet it. Um, uh, I want to, to begin, oh, actually, well, I was going to say, you know you made it when someone is absolutely nervous about 
making sure that the one time they ask you a question is like perfect. So <laughs> all this preparation right here just to make sure it's perfect. So okay. you made it. So um, uh, you talked about those kids whose mentalities are either, you know, I'm going to jail or I'm going to die. Uh, and uh, I grew up in Berkeley, California, which is not far from Oakland, where Marshawn is from. Mm -hmm. uh, and Marshawn made it because of football, but I see a lot of guys, um, and I'm, I know his, his little brother as well, but um, I know a lot of guys who haven't made it and sort of had that mentality. Um, and my, my question for you is, uh, you know, football in particular, the NFL are sort of great creations, for lack of a better word, uh, and they deserve a lot of the attention they get. Um, but sort of, I mean, there are other issues that seem more pressing that don't sort of get that national attention um, and in, in, in daily conversation on the news, however, however you think about it. Um, and uh, I, was, I was curious, you know, what responsibility, if any, do you think... This will uh, be the longest question of the yeah, night, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, I had to set it up. Uh, what responsibility, if any, do you believe that people with large followings, so like yourself, your players, celebrities in general, uh, have in sort of redirecting, redirecting some of that attention that they get towards yeah. these issues? Perfect. Um, and if any, how do you try to instill that in your players? Um, yeah. Okay. By far the best question of the night. Hey, let's hear from Howie. Way to go. Ahead. <laughs> um, well, I, I stumbled into it. I really stumbled into it just because I was moved by a, a situation that happened, uh, you know, in, in getting involved. I didn't know. I, at the time, I never even thought that I would have an ability to get people to come together or to make any kind of headway at all for a cause. And as, as our guys at Better LA and PCI guys that are here uh, that do this marvelous work in the community, at the time, I didn't even know they existed. But I, I did discover it that a lot of people showed up when we called a meeting. I got in all kinds of trouble on campus because I didn't ask anybody for permission. We just did it and got, people were coming in. We had no security, nothing. We had, a, we had Congress people and, and, and mayors and all kinds of people showed up somehow. But I found out that we did, we had a, there, there was an ability to convene and ability to facilitate somewhat. So I've just pursued that as we, as we have. And we've done a better LA here and we've done a better Seattle up in Seattle and have some things going. We're just a small part of that great cause, but uh, I hope everybody realizes that there is an opportunity to give. There is an opportunity to give back, and people give in their, their own special ways. And, and uh, in our sense, we, you know, we found a way to, to connect and try to help and do something positive, but we need more people helping and giving. There's so many great opportunities, and you can give in so many different ways, and it isn't about the money, it's about really giving of your heart. So that's, that's really where it comes from. I hope other people will do the same. Thanks. All right, man. How are you? Everybody. Got a question over here. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Coach. Uh, my name is Jackson. Thank you so much for coming. So much of what you said has been so great and inspiring. Cool. Um, this being an entrepreneurship class, uh, my question is, is there a, um, a risk that you've taken that you would really consider to be influential or the biggest risk you, that you've taken um, that you could speak a little bit about and how it's impacted your life, your decisions, um, your philosophy? Yeah, um, well, I, I think... You know, I've lived on the edge of risk throughout this coaching business because, you know, you lose your job so quickly and, you know, you're living on the edge of this thing and it's a, the, the risk that we took is, is to drag your family all over the country. How many times did we move, Glenny? Like eight, 14 times, you know, move the family all over the country to, to do this. You, you risk everything by doing that and, and uh, that, that was part of it. But I think if, if there is the biggest risk that I personally took, I was helped through by um, really... George Seifert, the coach that was at the 49ers, and, and Bill Walsh at the time. When I was challenged the most when I was in New England, I was challenged by the ownership and by everybody there to do it the way they thought it needed to be done. And I got fired because I didn't do that. And, and I, I stayed with what I was doing and hung on there and, and because they kept telling me, you, you got it right, you know what you're doing, don't back off, you know, and it'll work out. Well, it, it didn't. <laughs> I got fired, you know. But but it really, when I left that job, I still felt that strength. And so I didn't sanction the decision. I just went ahead and went to the next step. And, and so I, I, that is the risk. Is it, and this is a marvelous, I'm glad you brought it up, Jackson. It's a marvelous challenge to you to be who you are. Because everybody wants to be what you think you should be. That's the, that's the biggest problem. Everybody wants you to be this or be that. And that Robert Kraft wanted me to be some of Parcells and some of Pete. And, and it, I would have totally be, been inauthentic. I don't even know if that's a word. Is that a word? I don't know. Okay, but you know what I mean. All right. <laughs> and I wouldn't have been true to myself, and I never would have found the power of my own messaging if I had I not done that. So I would God, I just hope that some of you guys could, could figure that and go for it. What's up, buddy? Okay, thanks, Jax. What's up, Boomer? Let, How you doing, buddy? Last question. Let's see you again. See you. La last question. Uh, first oh. of all, just... No, stay there. You can, we'll get Dave's in charge, but he's sitting down, so I got it. Okay, here. I'm good. I'm good. Go ahead. 
Uh, Coach Carroll, just want to thank you. You're such an inspiration uh, to me, to everyone. Um, firsthand, I want to thank you for the opportunity of being a part of your football team as a walk-on. Um, you've given me such inspiration to be. Uh, oh yeah, come on, give him a little love, Coach. Right here. <laughs> Boomer. You're, uh, you've inspired me to become a coach, and uh, awesome. not only um, because of your enthusiasm and positiveness, um, but the impact that you have on your players and just the character that you build among all of your Thank players. You. And uh, my question for you is, when you're sitting in an office and a head coach asks you, why should I hire you as a coach, what's your response? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what, what do I'm I say one, when I'm, I ask I'm for the one asking the question, am I the head coach? Which one what you want, what so you I'm, say I'm, when I'm you're I'm sitting in your office and yeah. I'm asking to be an assistant coach. And what do I, what should you say, right? What should uh -huh. you say? You what should, should say, say exactly what's coming out of your heart. At the, at the moment you get to that point where now it's the, now it's the real test time. This is, the truth is not coming out. You speak right from your heart and let them feel where you're coming from. And if that doesn't get it done, screw them. Thank you. Sure. Last one. One more. One more. Hi, Pete. Uh, my name's sorry. My name's Hal Wright, um, and I'm in a sports analytics class here. And uh, we talk a lot about these advanced metrics. And obviously, you and John Schneider have done an amazing job of evaluating talent um, over the last couple of years. And so, I just want to ask you: um, Are you guys doing like using a lot of these advanced numbers, or is it more of an eye test, or what's sort of the process you go through when you evaluate a player? Yeah, we we use, because we're competing. We use every single bit of every bit of information we can interpret. And we, we trust that we'll be able to make sense of it because ultimately you come back to your gut. You, use all the, you get all the information possible and the information could totally choke you and, make, and stagger you. But we feel like we can handle. John's a really agile thinker and he's tremendous at it. We take all the information we can possibly get and then we, we back off until we get to the point where we can actually say what we feel. That's, that's how we do it. So um, there's marvelous stuff out there. Some makes sense, some doesn't. But we never stop at trying to figure out what the next thought might be to help us make great evaluations. But it really ultimately comes back to our gut. Uh, I want to ask a couple people to come up. So you, you want a, a final word? Yeah, to the I, I want to say this one more time. Because if you're, if you're coaching and you we're teaching, we've got to keep on coming back to the things that are really important. You have the power. You do. Nobody controls what's going to happen for you. Nobody else does. You will feel like they do. And you win fight that because you have the power to absolutely control where you're going and what you're doing. And, and if I could get that across to you, you, you will be able to become all that you're capable of becoming. And don't miss this chance. It ain't easy. You got to figure out what's important to you. You got to get down into it. You got to do the work. Not everybody that's going to leave here is going to take these words. But I'm telling you, go home, get your notebook out, and start writing down what's important to you. You think that that's a bunch of crap. It isn't. Make the words mean something to you. Don't do it just to do it. It won't do you any good. You write down what's important to you. And what, what, it doesn't even matter what it is. And just fill up the page and fill up another page and make words come to life for you because that is a commitment that you make to those thoughts that will make things turn for you in the right direction. You have this freaking power. I want to see everybody kick ass. Everybody gets to win. Everybody gets to do all that you can think of. That's the truth now. The only reason it doesn't happen is because you ain't listening to what I'm saying. It's, that, it's there for you. I wish you the very best. Thank you so much. It's great to have been here. Hold on. We're not done. Okay. Well, we got it. Hold on. Hold on. Don't go anywhere. I'm not going home. Right. That, that uh, it, it's, it's deserved, but it's, it didn't carry over to Seattle. I'd like to invite uh, a couple people up. Uh, Lloyd Greif, Helena. Uh, if you could please come up and join uh, me for a second. Ed Roski, I see you there. Would you mind joining us? Roski's you mind joining in the house. Us? What's up, Ed? Would you mind? Just go up, go take a right. Cool. And Craig Pollard. Where's Craig Pollard? Craig Pollard, our current entrepreneur of the, uh, alumni entrepreneur of the year. If Craig could make his way up, that would be wonderful. So we, uh, we have this, this tradition, and, uh, but this is a new tradition for us. Uh, for those of you who know the, the Greif Center, it's one of the only places on SC with its own logo. And it's a, uh, a series of circular dots with one dot standing out among all the rest, and that is the entrepreneur. And in this case, uh, it's the competitor. Um, Pete from USC, we can't thank you enough for everything you've done uh, for the program, for 
uh, the football program, and uh, on, a, on a personal level for my class. Uh, you came four years in a row to our MBA class, and it went from uh, 40 students, and now as an undergrad class, it's 300, and it's no small part from your inspiration and your mindset. So this reads, in appreciation, Pete Carroll, win forever, always compete. Our first competitor's award to Pete Carroll. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lloyd. Thank you. Thank you, Helena. Appreciate it. Ho! Oh. Oh. Come on in. Come on in. Come on. Hold on one second. Okay. Look. And, and Lloyd would like to add something before we take pictures. Yes, Lloyd Greif. So this normally does stand for the entrepreneur, but tonight it stands for something additional. So all these black dots are every other coach, <laughs> both college and professional. Pete stands amongst only two other coaches ever who have won a national championship at the collegiate level, NCAA, and in the NFL. And that is amazing. Pete so, Carroll. Guys, can you take a picture? Are you coming with us? Did you get some pictures? Everyone in. Everyone in. So, so careful, we, careful. We cut up there. Uh, yeah, yeah, Just okay. not the red dot. Anything but the red dot. All right, quick picture, and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Here we go. Thanks. Hey, by All the right. way, by the way, Will is buying at the 9 <laughs> <laughs> Stay here. Stay here. You know, I'm good. I'm good. Pete, as, as I said, it just, we, we can't thank you enough. It's been a great night, a great night at USC, a great homecoming to you and Glenna and Jamie and your family. There's only one way to send you out, brother. What Let's bring it. Let's hear it for Pete Carroll. Oh, awesome. Good night. Good night. Great job. Thank you.